Hello, Dr. Joffrey. You are a medical doctor and the author of uh, Longevity for Busy People. So welcome to Modern Health Span and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, so Dr. Joffrey, I think uh, the concept of longevity for busy people is a great idea because I think that uh, we can get too much down into the weeds and certainly it's something that you know, I am guilty of, you know, it's like looking at this, these molecular pathways and how this bit. So it would be great to distill the essence of how we can get the best outcome yeah, without, absolutely. For, for, for busy people, right? But right. Uh, to kind of start, could you share a little bit of your history and what led you to your current focus on longevity? Yeah, you know, um, so it's a little circuitous. Uh, I started out uh, in in college is, is very much a, a biochemistry and molecular biology geek. Um, you know, that was where my passion was. Ended up going to medical school and, um, and uh, did a surgical training. Ended up doing some um, training I'm pretty broadly, actually. I started out in neurosurgery, did head, head and neck surgery, and ended up doing some cosmetic surgery as I practiced, actually. So um, that uh, that was fairly short lived uh, because I think I found my interests in uh, were more in learning than they were in practicing. So um, a few years into practice, I I decided to try uh, try something else, and so I I became a an entrepreneur and uh, focused on real estate and uh, um, always kept keeping an eye on what was going on in the world of molecular biology and and biochemistry. Uh, a few years ago, I got divorced and I was in my mid forties and I was overweight and, uh, looked at myself in the mirror and said, how did this happen? And, uh, that got me into looking into longevity literature, frankly. And I think, you know, that was around the time, I think that, uh, David Sinclair had written lifespan and that sort of thing. And it really inspired me because it was pretty remarkable how this science had uh, progressed. So now I had this, uh, uh, obviously, a clinical perspective uh, from my, my uh, years as a physician uh, and then in medical school. And also, again, this biochemistry and molecular biology background. And what I realized was, it, to a certain degree, it seemed like there was there was uh, an ignorance on the side of the, the medical community on what was happening. And then in terms of the science community, perhaps an under uh, appreciation of, of the actual clinical things that we could do, the low hanging fruit that would help us potentially get to uh, a place where we could enjoy <laughs> the science that was coming in the near future. So, so that's why, as uh, you pointed out, I did, you know, I wrote this book, but, you know, it was really, uh, that's a work in progress. It's a, a podcast I have that I started called Sapio with Buck Joffrey. And uh, that's on, you know, YouTube and everything and, and the usual places, but really wanted to talk about this whole concept of marrying clinical knowledge with, with longevity and ultimately uh, also making it accessible because, you know, there's plenty of Brian Johnson's in the world and all of that data out there, but not, of a, not all of us live that way. And I would argue that we don't need to necessarily live that way, given what we, we might be experiencing over the next decade or two. I, yeah. So a couple of things to go back to in there. So what, how do you view the kind of longevity field at the moment? Um, I, I read the book and, and you're kind of optimistic and, I am. you know, that because some people, so, you know, um, are, I, I, I guess, less optimistic. Um, yeah. Saying, you know, we're still a long way from achieving, well, from achieving longevity, escape velocity, but really for, from uh, understanding aging well enough. So, uh, yeah, what, what's your view on where we are right now? You know, it, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, and sometimes it surprises me, frankly, that, uh, that, uh, is some of especially in the, on the uh, the clinical side of things that uh, that some of the physicians in the space are not more optimistic about the big picture. Um, what I would say is this: is that we already know uh, that we can, in the laboratory, uh, we can reverse aging. We've done it in multiple species, and if we can do it in the laboratory. There's, it doesn't take much of an imagination to see 
that this is going to happen. And in my view, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so, um, you know, it, it's funny because I do, you know, I do follow some of uh, the others in the space. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, say, you know, Peter Atia, for example. I mm -hmm. think he's a brilliant man. And Peter doesn't really, he's, he's pretty, he doesn't really like to talk too much about this idea of, you know, exceeding the numbers of, you know, 100 and 120 and stuff. Um, here's the thing, though. You know, I think he brought up in his book this uh, idea of uh, an electric car and, and uh, self-driving cars and things like that. And these were things that, you know, there was no evidence that they were going to happen, that they were going to be real. 20 years, but we had a pretty good idea that we had technology that may lead that way. So to me, just because we don't have evidence per se that we are going to hit this, uh, this longevity escape velocity or this ability to reverse age in, in human beings, we don't have evidence. Of course, we don't have evidence of that, but we have a lot of reason to believe based on what we know in animal models we, and and uh, with all the other technology that we have, that this should be something that we can do. So again, to me, it's it's not a matter of if, it's when. Yes, I I kind of agree with you on that, that it, it's really, uh, yeah, because we know that other animals can do it, like bowhead whales can live 200 years. <laughs> so there's no biological limitation. No, absolutely not. And and again, you know, the, the genetics there, uh, you know, some would argue that, you know, the genetics are uh, of aging are pre-programmed. Well, that's not an argument against reversal of age. In fact, that's an argument for our ability to manipulate the genome. Uh, it, quite the opposite, I would say. Yes, because it's a program. You can change it. Exactly. So... Just on longevity escape velocity, um, could you explain how you see that concept? And do you think we're there yet? Or do you think we'll even know whether it's like a bubble, right? You won't know until it's burst. <laughs> yeah. So so longevity escape velocity, you know, this this term itself, I think Aubrey de Grey was the one to to really bring mm -hmm. it to life. Um, mm -hmm. It's a... Uh, um, an interesting character, sort of polarizing. I think he's a very bright and a very mm -hmm. smart guy, a, a mathematician and a biologist. He, uh, but the concept is that um, you know that there is this, uh, there will be this period of time in which we, if you can get to it in a healthy uh, form, mm -hmm. if you're not already sick and about to die, that you should be able to uh, medicine or technology should be able to treat whatever ails you to take you to the next 20 years or so when the next thing that might try to kill you is also cured by that. So, so in a nutshell, the idea was you would escape this entire longevity uh, 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 paradigm. Now, so do I think we're near that? So I would say, I'd say two things. I think, yes, I think we're near it. I think we're already near it. I mean, again, we go back to the question of what's happening in the laboratory. Th this kind of technology plus the kind of money that's going into this, right? Mm -hmm. Think of all of those billionaires who made their uh, made their money in the internet uh, era, and now they have a ton of money and they don't want to die. Where's it going? And mm -hmm. and so so there's unlimited resources in the space. Uh, it's 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 it's. Uh, it's sort of, um, you know, the momentum is there. Mm -hmm. I would say, though, that I'm not sure that that's the way it happens, because, again, mm -hmm. longevity escape velocity, the way that that uh, that that's envisioned is that it's sort of a gradual process. I think it might be more abrupt than that. I think mm -hmm. it may be more of a matter of getting to a certain place and boom, all of a sudden we've got the cocktail. We've got, and then it becomes a matter of fine tuning that cocktail. Um, so one or the other, but I do think that, uh, um, you know, the, either way, I think the next decade or two decades, in my view, uh, should be sufficient time for it to happen. Interesting. So 
What do you see as the most exciting new technologies that are kind of being worked on at the moment? Well, you know, I think um, I think the discovery, you know, in medicine, the way it, it has always worked is we we come up with a uh, we figure out why a disease happens. We do the pathophysiology, you know, the mechanism by which that disease occurs. And um, in medicine, we didn't we've not recognized aging as a disease. Uh, and when you do recognize aging as a disease and you start looking at the pathophysiology of what it might be, I think the uh, probably there's two there's two things that I think are particularly uh, important for where we are right now. And one of them is David Sinclair's uh, theory on um, uh, disinformation theory, basically the information theory of aging. That's mm -hmm. one of them which is to understand that, and I think this is a, you know, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that he's on point with this theory, that there ultimately is this damage in the epigenome, which is the, uh, you know, the, the coding around the genes that ultimately uh, allows them to fold and express the way they want to express, that that is uh, chemical alterations there in the form of DNA methylations, et cetera, those types of things are underlying the, the, the entire aging process. So I think that's one thing. The next thing is uh, the Yamanaka uh, data. So uh, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, Nobel Prize for the uh, genes that ultimately were shown to uh, be able to, when activated, take a, a completely um, differentiated cell back into a pluripotent stem cell, effectively reversing the uh, the age of a cell. I mean, effectively making it a younger cell. So those two things in combination to me are very exciting because again, now you've said, uh, if, if you can say that David Sinclair's theory is right on the mechanism, we also see that there is a potential cure. So you can, you can potentially take uh, the Yamanaka uh, data and you can start focusing on that because presumably, and as Sinclair has later shown, uh, that if you do, if you do uh, stimulate Yamanaka factors to a certain extent, you can reverse that epigenetic damage. So again, that paradigm there to me is is super exciting and a great place to start. Now, uh, even with the Yamanaka factors, the 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 research around that, of course, was focusing on a genetic manipulation of that. But then, as you know, as you may know, in the last few months, uh, Sinclair's lab actually published a paper where they had a series of drug cocktails that seemed to essentially do the same thing. So again, this, uh, you know, it, it did the same thing in, in a Petri dish with human cells. So it was in vitro. It's not like it was, you know, in an actual human being. But how far away is that from reality? It sure seems a lot closer than, you know, um, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if you can show the principle, then it's just it's just mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. So thinking about the philosophy, so kind of moving on a bit. So think about the philosophy of optimizing aging. So we could do like the Brian Johnson thing. Well, yeah. if we have two million, well, actually, if we have multiple millions so that we have two million to spend on it and all our yeah. time, or we can just kind of stumble forward into chronic disease in our 60s. But what we want to be is somewhere in between. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, can I, how do you think about how much time should we spend? You know, how central should this health health span, extending the health span be to uh, to our life? So I think that what um, Brian Johnson is doing and others are doing is is helpful to us. It's admirable, but it's certainly not something I would want to do, even if I, you know, even if I had the, the resource, unlimited resources that uh, Brian Johnson has, it's not something I would want to do because frankly, I like eating. Uh, I don't like protein pellets and pudding, and I don't want to have dinner at 11 a.m., right? So 
there's a there's a fine line here, right? We also want to enjoy our lives. And for most people, and I'm not saying all, uh, that that kind of life does not sound particularly enjoyable. And and certainly for me, it would not be. Mm. Uh, the good news is that I think that you can get the vast majority of what you need to stay healthy for uh, an extended period of time with relatively low hanging fruit. And a lot of that is, is, is uh, you know, I, I still think that it, in, in this book, uh, I should point out again, it's not, uh, the draft is uh, uh, available at uh, sapiopodcast.com, but it's, it's not even on Amazon yet. So you can just download it for free there. Uh, but I think if anybody who doesn't, anybody who doesn't really know a lot of these things, if they simply read and follow some of the basic ideas and concepts in that book, they were very likely to extend their lifespan a few years, a health span as well. They're not that difficult. It does require, to your point, it does, um, in terms of time and resources, what does it require? Um, I still am a uh, Full time. Uh, I, I still work. You know, I still work on my companies full time. There's nothing I'm doing that prevents me from doing that. How much does it cost me? It might cost me a little bit more than than the average person because I do buy a number of supplements. Um, I you know I have a concierge doctor, which I have who I, with whom I have a very good relationship, and that costs a little bit more. And I use some devices. Um, that are not terribly expensive, but they do cost a little bit of money. I don't, but but net net, I don't think it needs to be uh, that big of a uh, a big of a problem for people to who are interested in longevity and who like the idea that hey, if I can stick around in good health for the next ten to fifteen years, I might get to cheat for the rest of it. <laughs> so.